Hi, I'm James Aitken. This video will introduce you to 3D printing and how I have used it to produce parts for my wagons and also accessories for the model railway layout. So, what is 3D printing? 3D printing is the making of solid parts by building up layers. There are a number of different ways of doing this and this video will cover two that are most popular for hobbyists like ourselves. Here are some examples of what can be done with 3D printing. We have over here a small lamp hut that was produced in one go on a 3D printer. We have the roof, as you can see, Southern Railway standard van roof. Here we have an example of almost a complete wagon body. This is a Southern Railway uh, bullied well wagon. That's actually made up of four parts. The two sides are the same design. The two ends are the same design and that's just been temporarily clipped together. And over here we have examples of some 3D printed parts. These are pretty tiny. These are axle boxes. And just about C. They're made in clear acrylic. Slightly difficult to uh, see. And here, little buffer bodies even with the, uh, the bolt heads and brake shoes and a brake lever guide it's a very small detailed part and in further parts for chassis these are 3D printed vacuum cylinders the first steps in 3D printing are to design the part that you want to make using some form of 3D CAD. Two 3D CAD packages that run on typically PCs and Apples are Fusion 360 which is available free to hobbyists like ourselves and SolidWorks which I've used in the past professionally but is very expensive. You're looking at £5,000 per seat. I'm now going to show you how to create a 3D drawing. I'm using Fusion 360 which is available for free for hobbyists. Um, you only have to pay for it if you intend to use it for commercial purposes. The drawing I'm going to do is going to be that of a, um, uh, a buffer body. So it's fairly simple. When you draw a part you first need to decide whether it's something you can draw a shape in and extrude it, or whether you want to draw a cross section and revolve it. Um, this demonstration will show you both of those techniques. First thing to do is to uh, create a sketch, and here we need to select uh, one of the planes, <coughs> either X, Y, or Z plane, and in this particular case, I'm going to choose uh, that plane to begin with. I then, uh, for the buffer body, I'm going to do a section of the top half. So for that I'm going to start with a rectangle and define its height as being um, 1.6 millimeters by 8 millimeters in length and that will give me a rectangle of that shape. Now at the front of the, the buffer there will be a small um, uh, bump or flange and for that I can create that using an arc, a tangent arc, which I can draw from that line, curve it round until it meets the line at the top. And I can define the size of that to be 0.3 in radius. So now that has produced me the little bump on the side and you'll see later on what the effect that has. I can then use the scissors up here to trim out the bit of line that I no longer require. So I now have a section like that. I can complete that sketch and that is my shape. I can then revolve that one choosing that shape. I want to go all the way around. Uh, 
a full diameter. I have one shape selected. I need to select the axis about which the revolve will, will happen and there you have it. So I have now managed to draw the main part of the buffer and you can see the effect of the little bump at the front of the buffer itself. Okay, the next thing to do is to draw the plate that the buffer sits on. Once again, create a sketch and this time I choose the plane that exists at the back end. I can now draw a much bigger circle starting in the same centre, 7.1 in diameter. And that doesn't want to be a circular base, that wants to be a slightly cut off base. So for that I draw a line, it doesn't matter where I draw it, it can just be drawn across there and a second one towards the bottom. Okay, my two lines, I want them to be a particular distance from the centre line, so I can use sketch dimension to select those lines in the middle of the circle, and then I can type in 2.6 millimetres, and that is the distance I require, and I do the same to the other line. Okay, so I've now got the two lines in the right places. But once again I've got extra lines I don't require, so I can use the scissors to take them away. Take the circle away, take the extra bits of line at the end away, and that one, and that one. Sorry, I've taken the wrong bit there. Trim that, get rid of that bit, get rid of that bit, and that bit there. Right, I now have my shape that I require. So a circle, cut off top and bottom. I complete that sketch and then I can use the extrude command to bring that out to the thickness I require. And in this particular case I select my object but I also select the centre part as well. I want the whole thing expanded. And I can type in the distance which will be 0.5 of a millimetre. OK. And there we have it. So we now have the base to our buffer defined. The last thing I want to do is to draw the piece of um, the body that will go through the, um, uh, the, the uh, buffer beam itself. So here, once again, create a sketch. It's all about creating a sketch and extruding that sketch and building those up one at a time. Select the bottom a circle centered in the same place for three millimeters diameter and I'm done. Once again extrude that, select the shape I want to extrude, type in the distance that I want to extrude it by, two millimeters, and there we have the little stub that goes through. Now the last thing we need to do is to put a hole down the middle for the parkside metal buffer to go down. So here I can rotate the part again and this time create a sketch on the front of the buffer head, buffer body rather, and this time I want to drill a hole through the material of 1.7 millimeters in diameter. That's all I want to do. So now I use extrude again, select my shape, this time I do not want it to be a new shape, I want it to be a cut and I want it to go all the way through all the layers. So I select all for extent and I find that the arrow is pointing in the opposite direction and I can't press OK. And that's because I'm going the wrong way. So I can flip that and you can see now it's drawn the hole through in red and I've now got a hole through the buffer. OK, I think we can see that that is starting to look like uh, a buffer. I can now add all sorts of other features like ribs to it, etc. And I have built one of those previously to give you an idea of what a complete buffer body will look like. Having drawn your part, the next step is to export that drawing as a stereolithography file. 
STL. This file contains the 3D drawing that you've produced and is a suitable input for the next step. Then you want to slice it. Now slicing really produces, it tells the 3D printer each layer and what the dimensions of that layer and it all the components of that layer. It slices the model into every single layer that is going to be produced by the 3D printer. Here we have our model in Fusion 360. So here, in order to produce an STL file, we go to the Tools menu and the Make sub-menu and choose 3D Print. This will then come up with some, some options. You do not want to actually send it to a 3D Print utility, but you need to select the entire buffer body, which is what you are going to actually put out. And then press OK and you will get a file selector where you can then save the part onto your hard disk as an STL file. Having got your STL file, your next step is to load it into the slicing software. So here we open the file that you want to add and you can see that the part has been added there. You can move and rotate that part. At the moment that is lying down, which is not the best way of doing it. You really want to stand it up like this one here. So you just use the arrows to move the part until that part is standing up the right way. You can check in different orientations to make sure that you do have that part standing up properly, which we do. You can see there, that's your part sitting ready to be sliced. The next step is to slice that and then save it, save the slice file to a suitable directory. Once you've designed your part, we now need to actually make it using one of the available machines. There are two basic types available for us in the hobby. The first is fused dep deposition modelling. This technique uses a filament of plastic and squirts the plastic through a heated nozzle into the shape that you require, one layer at a time. Second method, stereolithography, SLA, uses a resin. And in this particular case, the, um, the resin is poured into a bath over a screen and each layer is formed using a LED um, light source which then cures one layer of the resin at a time. There are other methods, metal sintering, laser curing, but these are expensive methods and really are outside the scope of this talk. For us hobbyists there are two main different types of 3D printer that we need to consider. The first one is called fused deposition modelling. This one uses a bead of plastic which is then squirted at layer, one layer at a time. Uh, but it does produce quite a rough surface, I don't know if you can see on here. And you can certainly sound, hear it. You can hear my nail rubbing against each of the layers that's produced by the plastic. The other technique is a, a resin technique. And this uses a bath of resin which is cured by um, UV light. And this produces a much smoother, much more fine part. I mean this doesn't really have any visible striations or lines in it. The first type, fused deposition modelling, uses a filament of plastic. It tends to produce a coarser model. It doesn't usually have a smell relatively inexpensive method. The materials are quite reasonably inexpensive and you can watch the build happen as it builds up each layer you can actually see the model being produced. This is a Prusa Mini fused deposition modelling type of 3D printer using a filament, a plastic filament, which is fed into a heated nozzle which is then squirted into the shape that you require. We've now loaded the drawing into the machine 
the machine is now going to prepare itself by checking to make sure that the base plate is level checking various points it will also heat the nozzle to the required temperature and only once it's completed all those initial uh, initialization tasks will it start to print. This initialization phase takes about four minutes on this machine. So now the machine has begun to print the part. It first of all puts a, a sort of base down really that uh, allows it to stick to the heated bed of this machine. And then gradually it'll start to build up the layers. This particular part, which is a, a buffer body, is estimated to take about three minutes to produce. We can clearly see the tube of the buffer body being produced here. The second technique, SLA, uses resin in a bath. This can be quite smelly and really isn't something you want to do in the, in the house. Once you take the parts out of the bath, they're covered in resin and they will need washing in isopropyl alcohol. The benefits of this technique are that you can get a very high resolution down to 0.01 of a millimetre. This produces a very fine surface detail. The resin is quite expensive to buy but once you've bought a pot of resin, it really does go a long way. The other slight disadvantage is that you can't see the model until after the first hour, typically, because the model builds up inside the resin, and only when it comes out of the bath do you start to see the model that's actually been produced. So here we have a typical resin type of 3D printer. First thing to do is to put the resin in, Go and select your drawing that you wish to produce. That will show you on the screen what it is you're going to make. And then the part you can see gradually gets built up. The plate is the plate that the part is being built on and it's sitting in the resin bath at the moment. You can't see the model until it starts to become, it starts to come out of the bath. And you can then start to see that hanging from the plate at the top, your part is starting to be produced. Once the whole part is out, that will move clear of the bath and then you can remove the parts from the plate. Here we can see the plate being taken out. The parts are quite wet so they go into a container and are washed in IPA. So while these parts are reasonably hard, they actually still need to be cured. That can be done in bright sunshine for a few hours, and then the part will be completely cured. As you can see, the detail on these parts is quite extensive. One of the wonderful things about 3D printing is you can make parts that really you couldn't see any other way these could be made. Once you've produced your 3D parts, you can then add them to your model. Here we see an example of the 3D printed roof seen at the beginning of the video. that's now been added to a Southern Railway uh, standard van. In addition, the buffer bodies here, they are the ones that have been 3D printed. The axle boxes are also 3D printed as are the brake shoes and the highly detailed brake lever guides. You will also recall the bullied well wagon parts that were shown at the beginning of the video. These are the original parts and this 
is what they make into when complete. The rest of the model has been produced by hand with the exception of the buffers which were parkside. These are little brass angle, they are I-beams from Eileen's, a bit of brass at each end. The 3D printed parts are quite light so that actually gave the wagon a bit of weight. And then just standard wheels fitted. And finally, here are some Diagram 1380 Southern Railway open wagons. Once again, all the parts, the actual boxes, buffer bodies, brake shoes and brake lever guides are the same 3D printed parts as you saw on the standard van. All the sides are laser cut, so these wagons have been produced entirely by hand, with the addition of some very useful bits of machinery. I hope you've enjoyed this video and it's taught you something about 3D printing.